So we are Joshua, Daniel, Karina, Melody, and we're going to talk about a topic which affects us all. Uh, we're talking about energy and policy, climate change. Um, the global warming develops more and more, and some countries already feel the effect of those global warming. For example, the state of Seychelles, I think you call it like that in English, uh, already feels that the water po uh, level is rising more and more, and the highest point of that country is only about three, four meters high. So if it gets uh, worse and worse, Seychelles will be overflowed with water and gone. Um, so we start with major problems and concerns. No, first I'm going to oh, start sorry. with the differences in Germany and USA, so what we change or how we behave um, about the climate change. And we realized that in Germany the people walk a lot more and um, they have carpools or they just took, uh, take the bike to go somewhere. And uh, the students get their car much later than here because we are only allowed to drive at the age of 18 and here you are allowed to drive at 16 so we have it later on. And um, the gas prices are really high and in the USA the people just normally take their car to go somewhere and the students have their cars like really early and um, the gas prices are very low. Um. Major problems and concerns. Um, the demand of oil, gas, and uh, coal continues to grow uh, as we continue to drive and such. And uh, the misuse and overuse of limited water resources. So we have like 3% of like uh, drinking water and clean water, not salt water and stuff. And then uh, global warming is the major concern of everything because it affects the whole world. Solutions. Um, we said that the United Nations could come together and create a global policy or law that demands that citizens. You, can you turn around and talk to the group? Okay. Um, read, read through and you turn around and then you talk to the group. Okay. Um, the United Nations should create a policy or law that demands that citizens conserve water, uh, recycle, or conserve fuel or revert to hybrid cars, electric cars, so instead of using oil. Um, we could have countries enforce awareness and require citizens to take classes every year that are based off being green and taking care of our environments. And we can adjust to, instead of stopping the greenhouse, we can adjust to it, its splurge and stop companies from selling gases and resources that just for profit and just use resources that, renewable resources that aren't harmful to our environment. Yes, and the future outlook, how it m might look when we um, do the things uh, we could do for the for, the, speak for our planet. Speak up. Um, if we do these things, the people can recognize that we must take care of our planet and we recycle and we conserve our um, our things and um, 
if the people now they that they um, have to walk or go by bike somewhere, if they do it, the planet will last longer and um, as well our limited resources. We can't stop the, um, the climate change, but we can slow it down. So. People can continue. People can continue to abuse and misuse our planet and its resources, and eventually. Speaker, I'm an old man. I cannot hear you. And eventually, we run out of resources. Conflict, conflicts arise, and the world may end or be left in the environmental disaster. So that was our presentation. If you have any. So she was going to be out of work, and she wasn't going to have the money to, um, to like, buy live. things, live, and, you know, buy things that could help the economy circulate. And I think that without those jobs, it kind of helps us crash and burn. So I'm going to present um, the main questions we were asked on our early sheet, just to uh, give you guys a sense of... Uh, what we were talking about. So the first question was, uh, what caused the financial crash in uh, 2007? So basically, the problems were that the country spent more money than they had. And the other one was that um, the banks took or uh, invested in uh, projects and they had a really high risk. So um, the next question was, uh, what is centralism? And Thatcherism is um, basically the ideas Margaret Thatcher came up with, and her main ideas are that, um, are that uh, yeah, like about a free market, so that prices should be set by sellers and buyers and not uh, be controlled by the, by the state, by the government. And the last very, very important question was um, what risks? Um, banks have to face, and one risk would be that um, loans will, or could not be paid back, so they use, or they could lose their money on that, and the other risk would be that, um, yeah, that, uh, that their clients, their customers would withdraw their money because um, they, are afraid, uh, they are afraid of losing it, but that makes it even worse and harder for the banks to um, yeah, sure. Exist. Um, so the major concerns of the economic crisis, um, there's an international lack of money. Um, banks are spending money and people, they're not paying back their loans to the banks, so banks can't pay back their loans. So banks are losing money and countries are in debt because all of the banks are losing their money. And the dollars are losing value, or the, do the base dollar is the face value of the dollars is in value. Yeah. The solution is to spend money on things that you can that can lose their value, for example, houses or gold. <coughs> um, the countries who, who borrow money need to fulfill certain conditions to avoid another financial crash. <coughs> you also need to stimulate economy and countries adapt. Another solution is a free market, but it is necessary to control the banks. Uh, the potential risk is uh, countries borrow money all the time. Debt worldwide 
that it's too hard to pay off. And the economy can only grow so much to pay off the interest rates. So failure to, failure to pay debts can result in wars or action that can be international or civil to secure that money. And the cycle of money is broken and can cause a crisis effect. And if nothing changes about this, all countries would be poor and everyone would have to start earning money at the very beginning. Um, so now we're going to ask if any of you guys have questions. Yes, Travis? Um, well, one thing that we all know about, like, he's uh, economic, like, it's called Keynesian economics, I think. And I think what the uh, policy is, is like, what countries do is they have periods where they spend more and cut taxes. And then they go into the next period where they raise the taxes and cut the spending. And then that helps keep kind of the balance that. of the debt. But well, like a lot of, I think one of the problems was a lot of people, the government does, is, in a, is agreeing to do one of the things but not to the other. Like the Democrats want to raise the taxes and the Republicans want to cut the spending, but they don't want to do the other. See, I think that um, with that, they, I think that the political parties should, um, like, get their, get both their ways. One, like, one half of the year, they can cut spending and lower, or, what did you say, cut spending and raise taxes, and then the next half of the year, they can uh, raise spending and lower the taxes. So I think it could be the best of both worlds with that. Um, so that each party gets their, uh, what they want. Yes, Jax? So the United States of America is around $17 trillion in debt. And this is obviously not uh, going to be able to be paid off in anyone's lifetime. So to reach, and each child in the U.S. is born with about $100,000 worth of, worth of debt uh, to their name. Which, uh, which leads me to the question, like, how would we reach uh, a conclusion with a different country to where we wouldn't have to be uh, enslaved by them instead of, like, I mean, not enslaved, you know what I mean. Just like... To not be in debt with them? For not be completely be so far in debt to where subliminally they control our economy completely. Right. Um. Well, the thing is, to cut spending, there's so much spending in our country that it's absolutely unnecessary. And I'm not even going to get to the sequester. But um, if we just cut the unnecessary spending, like, the go like, for example, the government is giving scholarships to students to go to college, which, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But a school should give scholarships. Right, not the, gov it's, it's, it's but, the government doesn't have that money. But um, all examples aside, there just needs to be less spending and right. more responsible spending. Where would the school get the money? Um, not schools, but like scholarship programs. There's scholarship programs that raise money specifically for yes. giving scholarships. So more fundraising yes. from the private yes. sector? Yes. <coughs> yes, Travis? Yeah. Well, mentioned the sequester. Like the sequester, it only cut 8% in like the um, the non this uh, it's the spending that isn't that isn't social security and welfare which takes up those two take up sixty percent for and growing of what we spend and then out of the other forty percent half of it's military spending and the other half is everything else so cut, making cuts in the twenty percent that's everything else doesn't help the debt when. They cost more when it's growing. Um, with, uh, with the military spending, what I think that we should do, if we're not in a, like if we're not in a war that is costing us an extreme amount of money, like what they're giving the military, then we shouldn't have to pay that much for it. That's just my thing. There's upkeep and there's like the pay for the <coughs> just all the stuff that goes on during the training, everything that goes on while the military is not. Yes. 
I've got a question. Okay, so it's, it's pretty clear that we need more revenue coming into the government and we need less spending. So how are we to accomplish that if Congress is not willing to raise taxes to raise the revenue and they're not willing to cut? So if you, if you have a situation where you do have to find ways to cut expenses and you still need to raise revenues to cover the deficit, how can you do that if neither side if you're not willing is willing to, do, to cooperate? I think not willing to do either, then I don't think it's possible. Right. So what, I think what that message everyone, can you send? I think that everyone should have an open mind. You know, like, they can't be like, oh, we cannot cut spending. You know, they, right. they need to not be extremists about it. Personally, yeah. I think that, like, corporate taxes should be lowered so that we can actually bring back some, like, domestic industry. Because yeah. a lot, because a lot of them are going to like other countries, and that's like that's money that could be spent here. Right, exactly. Is that because of tax rates, or is it because of lower uh, labor costs? Well, both. Because like here, the tax rates are way higher for corporate uh, companies, and plus, like they can pay like they can pay people like so much less in other countries. Mm -hmm. But I think that put, taking those uh, companies to other countries allows it basically sets us up for failure because we're not having. You know, yes, we're spending less on those uh, deals, but like people aren't having those jobs. People in America don't get those jobs to get the money to stimulate our economy, to buy things. And that's what we need. Uh, Jax. Um, do you think that, that becoming a more independent nation as to uh, drilling oil and making our own products, our own? Uh, our own products in country instead of uh, buying them elsewhere. Do you think that that could help us become, uh, I don't know, more independent and help help our uh, our really poor spending choices? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, oh, oh, this is the last one. One of the things I noticed y'all are talking about a lot of the ways to help. America's economy, but it's also a world economic crisis. There's countries, I, there's a lot of countries that are a lot worse off than America. And actually, America, for right now, with our, and we're not good in the long term, but in the short term, we're still okay. And a lot of people are trying to fix the short term for America. But even if we brought all the jobs back to America and instead of outsourcing, the out, outsourcing, it would only help our economy. It wouldn't help the economy in the, of the entire world. It would actually probably hurt a lot of the countries that are benefiting from the new industries that are coming into the areas. That makes sense. I see your point completely. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. How do you, uh, there's, there's always going to be a cycle of money, though. Yeah. It's just like it's going to come from somewhere. Great. Did you have a question earlier? Yes, I did. Sorry. Okay. Do you think in order to prevent a war and people become poor, do you think we should stop borrowing money for fun Oh, definitely. Because then we have to pay it back with money, money that we don't have because we spend the money the countries give us, and it just makes us out to have even more debt, you know? And we really don't want that. So I think, I think, like, a way to, like, save more money, you know, like in previous wars, like Americans, like like the government has asked the citizens of America to like cut spending and save all that you can, conserve everything. And I think a lot of people feel like that's an, maybe the government think, thinks that that's an outrageous request or something. Um, right. I read, I read, I read a figure that said, the money that was spent in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, every house in the United States could be equipped on their roof with solar panels. Yeah. Can you imagine that? That would mean for you, you would not have to worry about energy anymore. That would become a lot of, you know, of the spending that Americans have to do, and that that let us save a lot. Yes, Ty? Okay, so. Oh, like about the outsourcing I was talking about, our companies are having their products made in other countries because it's cheap to do that. If, say, there was some plan put in place to force companies to make their products here, don't you think that the prices of the products that we buy every day, they're just going to increase more? Like, you think shoes, like these shoes that I'm wearing right now cost like maybe $50? 
about, and they were made in probably some third world country, if they were made here, and they had to pay more to have people make them, don't you think that these shoes would become like, even a more ridiculous price, like maybe even $100, because the price that they pay those third world country people, pennies in the dollar, based on what they would have to pay, pay people here, like minimum wage, the prices on the products that we buy every day, like shoes, all that stuff would just triple and would not, I feel, would more damage the economy rather than hurt it because no one's going to have enough money to buy everything. It's like when, back whenever, during the French Revolution, people couldn't buy the food that was offered to them. That's why people were starving because the food was so expensive, but the jobs that they had weren't paying enough. And so if you can't buy those products that you need, then there's no revenue going back into the American economy. Yes, but see, like, the shoes that I'm wearing probably cost about 50 bucks too. But how much does it, how much do companies spend on supplies to make these shoes? What, like, three, three dollars? Maybe a little bit more or less? Why, why do they, why do they make us spend so much on shoes that hardly, you know, cost anything to make? I think if they brought them back and they uh, to America and they sold it for the same price, they'd still be making a huge profit. It's not it's, the reason they cost so much is not because of the materials that it makes that it costs to make it. It's the manual labor that is needed to make it. Yes, but they hardly. They I'd like hardly to uh, add something here, and then we're going to have to go ahead and wrap it up because it's time to head back. But um, keep in mind that most of these companies that outsource are international uh, corporations who are publicly traded, whose stock is owned by people all across the globe. So you're talking about all of us. You're talking about every nation, every investor, whether it's in Germany or in France or Russia or in the United States, able to buy and own stock in those publicly traded corporations. So it's a global economy. It's all interlinked, and what happens here affects Portugal and what happens in Portugal affects us and the money has swapped hands so many times and been lent to each other. So we're all in it together and uh, I think that this was an outstanding discussion and it could go on for a long time. So thank you guys so much. It was very good. Okay. I'm Liam. I'm Jack. I'm Joe. I'm Louis. And I'm on um, our topic was the threat from North Korea, and I'm pretty sure most of you all have heard how they are threatening the U.S. with nuclear missiles and nuclear weapons. Um, I'm just going to give you guys a heads up. It's a, very, it's a very wide subject. There's so many outcomes, so many things that could happen that there's no definite, we don't have a definite um, solution for it, but we do have things that could happen. Several. That's what I'm looking for. Huh? Yeah, several outcomes. And Jet. New York. All right. So some major concerns we have is the nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, and obviously North Korea is threatening us with these nuclear attacks. So. Um, and if that does happen, another concern that we have is we can break out of war, and that would disturb a whole lot of people, especially South Korea, because they're right there. Um, human rights is also a big issue because all the people in North Korea are starving and like poor, so and they're not being treated right. Um, North Korea's uh, allies with Iran, so another major concern we have is them and oil, because if we attack North Korea or if Iran has any kind of like hatred for us anymore, then they could they could uh, shut off all their oil to us, and we would that would be expensive. Um, political relations and false propaganda are big problems. False propaganda because North Korea is basically brainwashing their people into thinking that everyone's evil except North Korea and it's a big, it's a nationalist kind of thing to do. Um, and the political relations, there's just so many people that 
it would affect so many governments and economies and things like that. And uh, you're definitely right. We're definitely right about the. It's <coughs> it's not just people are stereotyping this situation as just the U.S. and North Korea, it, which in fact it's it's the whole globe. It's it, it affects everybody. Nuclear warfare and nuclear fallout can reach anybody at any point, and it, it affects the whole globe. It's a, it's a global crisis. It's not just between North Korea and the United States. It could really hurt the environment. Yeah. And um, our medical solution for the solutions are that we might just try to limit North Korea's access to nuclear weapons and nuclear power. So and try we we want to avoid war at all costs. So we try to like talk to them, negotiate. If they don't like, um, they uh, don't agree and still want to. If they still continue threatening us and the world, we just have to um, not not react, like only defend ourselves. If they really attack, but I doubt we re we all really doubt that will really happen. So if we just like ignore them for a longer time, we hope that we can get them. We doubt it will really happen due to the fact that they are not their people. They can't even feed their own people at the moment. They don't have supplies, they don't have the resources to fund the war. So that would be really not smart to try to start war with, especially America. Our military is very strong, very powerful. It just wouldn't be a correct move. And um, yeah, we are trying to um, get the people of North Korea because we are sure they don't all agree with their government. So we try to like, get them the information so they can maybe just start a revolution of their own and overthrow the government because it's really a problem how people are treated in there so they don't have food, don't have anything and they're basically like controlled and we just try to get a ride and calm them. Yeah. We came up with the analogy with the, a comparison actually just to the situation is the boy who cried wolf because the threats have been coming, but nothing's been done about it. Sure, they've been moving uh, warheads around and, and uh, doing military marches and such, but nothing has really been, they've not really stepped out and, and confronted us in any way. Um, should they enter, they've entered a, a state of war with the South, which has happened before, but eventually, we might just not, we might be uh, underestimating them and just thinking that they're not going to do it and that it's just an empty threat, but it actually happens. So at all costs, even when we don't think that they're going to do it, we still have to keep our guards up all the time. North Korea is like a baby with a gun. They have all these nuclear power, all these nuclear weapons. Well, I mean, it's not really a lot of nuclear weapons, but they do have potential to hurt other countries. But they're so. I don't want to say unorganized because I don't know, but so small, I guess. That it's, I don't have a better word for that, but they're so small. It's not. So we really just want to avoid war, and um, if we can find a way to help the people of North Korea just like, make them have better supplies and improve their living conditions. We think that it's also important to, well, to let them, uh, <coughs> well, a way out so that when they, okay, I don't know what to say. <laughs> It's not up to you to change a country or um, general thought. It's up to the people who live there. Yeah. So you you just can give the uh, given um, information maybe or um, a world that is open-minded and accepts all of us. But changing it or change can only made can only be made by the people who live there. 
So we we can we we may we uh, may kill Kim Jong Un. We may uh, get all the all the government right now, but we can't change their minds. It's it's not our thing. This can only happen uh, by the people. So, because yes. if we cause our uh, what we believe is like freedom, uh, our way of living on them, then it wouldn't be really what they want, but just what we want, and we would force our beliefs on them, and they would still hate us, like the hate would stay in their minds, and history would just repeat itself, so it's oh. up to them, really. Our potential risks were, of course, nuclear war, which we want to avoid at all costs, because nuclear fallout uh, creates devastating effects on the environment, and both... Um, the people and political relations. Uh, we want to strictly avoid getting the North Korean citizens killed by starting their own revolution. I mean, their own revolution would be good, sure, but it would be more risky than, dip than uh, diplomacy. Uh, we don't want to risk nuclear fallout on South Korea, of course, because South Korea being our ally, we, of course, don't want any devastation to come to them. We do not want to ignore, completely ignore Kim Jong-un, uh, which would anger him into claiming uh, the ignorations as an act of war. And we also, uh, by attacking North Korea, we would, we would uh, potentially like destroy our our business with China, which is their ally, which would disrupt our economy massively. Right now, though, China's not, they already, they're not backing North Korea because they are smarter. They, they know what they're doing. But we also really want, don't want to, like, cause death because every action of war eventually results in people dying and no matter if they're Korean or American or whatever, it doesn't matter, we just want to avoid that. And the requirement for the solution is that we all go to the debate about finding a solution, not as representatives of a special interest or of representatives of a special country, but as, as uh, human beings. Because we all live on this little planet and, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, now we'll be in conclusion, I think. Don't know if Kennedy said that, we heard that. Yeah, yesterday. yes, exactly, yeah. Exactly. Uh, so. our, our conclusion is a main topic, a sum up topic that is um, history repeats itself and to think from the past and, and correct our mistakes from the past. For example, uh, the attacks, attacks from, from the, the Middle East have resulted in us stationing ourselves there, and people in the Middle East still have the stereotype that we're these awful war-driven people, and that we're greedy, and that we're selfish, and that all we want to do is kill people. And that that's not what the solution that's, that we want to reach with North Korea. Uh, we want to, cause, because stepping foot in North Korea would, would fill every stereotype that Kim Jong-un has set for us. So. Our solution is we need to learn from our history and try always try to find a peaceful peaceful way and just look at what has happened so far, think about it and just take action after we have considered everything. I think that was a good conclusion. As a oh yeah, yeah. I'm just in a, just in addition, as a future outlook you can a little bit compare the situation in, uh, from North Korea to South Korea as the Eastern and Western Germany and the, the reunion of Germany took um, or the, the, the source of this reunion was the population. So it's up to the population in North Korea to reunite the bride Korea.
Very quickly, one minute for you to write down a question that you like that you didn't write. We are Sabrina, Carly, and Kristen. And we're going to tell you something about the world hunger. One of the biggest issues is that the government is only concentrated on the issues and not on the problems of the population. They should use their unemployed people, for example, for infrastructure. Improvements in Africa would make them able to get use of better technology. Another issue is that they are not independent enough on the weather to produce crops. Our potential solutions are that the population and the government should be taught and united. So the population should have more influence on the government and um, they should learn how to spend money correctly and uh, plan families. But especially the, go the government um, uh, should be taught because even though the population has um, or is invited and um, they are still dependent and on the government. So, um, because the task of the government is to take care of the people and the welfare of the country, so um, they should solve the uh, social problem and they should learn how to spend money for significant problem, problems um, like food and not only for building a weapon. And um, this is why we think there should be international meetings so that the whole world could discuss their issues together and um, not only social but also economic problems. Still going on the new solution, like she said, to have better communication with the government and giving the people a chance to actually talk to the government about all these problems and helping with solutions. And with like mostly like hunger problems and running out of food, and getting the farmers to regrow their crops after the whole weather and climate change, to regrow their crop crops and um, sell them and trade with other countries so they can have more food. Right. Uh, so the potential risks are that the people are probably not open-minded enough to um, communicate with each other. And when they have disagreement, uh, probably or maybe a uh, war would break out, like in the worst case. And that maybe people could turn against the government because uh, they're not willing to work. I mean, if anybody has to work, but um, and um, yeah, that maybe when something bad happens, that they just are frustrated and they don't continue. The future outlook, the people could become more happier and healthier, and more people won't starve as they trade with other countries. And it also would create more jobs if they trade with other countries, and if the countries were to come over and allow factories to be built, because it would allow people to have more jobs and not want to just be lazy. If Africa chooses to trade with another country, it would also benefit them because it would allow them to have someone uh, to have a good resource and allow them to use them wisely. And if they needed help with like anything, they could rely on them. So um, I guess we'll go back to the, uh, the structure that we had before. So take a few, or just take one minute or so to think of your questions that you'd like to ask.
I guess we should get going. Who has uh, the first question? Beth? Um, how are you going, how are you going to feed everyone? By allowing the people, the own countries, to also make farms and also to try to trade with other countries. And yeah. Don't you think to like start that or like I don't want to sound like a jerk, but I personally don't think, I think there's always going to be world hunger. Like, Say that again. I think there's always going to be world hunger. I think there's always going to be a certain country or a certain continent that has people that are hungry. Do you, do you believe that there can, there can actually be something that can feed everybody? example produce which goes by so quickly. I'd like to interject an example that I heard on the news just the other night. It was in Southern California, a strawberry farmer that didn't have enough of people to harvest the strawberries and therefore there were thousands and thousands of strawberries going bad. The reason why he didn't have enough people is because of the recent immigration deportations and difficulties in getting across the border where in the past he had Mexican migrant workers who would pick the strawberries. He didn't have enough and the question was asked him, well, why don't you hire Americans? Americans need jobs. He said, I've tried. They, they won't work in the fields. So therefore, the strawberries are just going bad because of a policy that was made. How do you feel about that, or what's your response to that? I feel like he was right because they don't want to work. Because sometimes Americans feel that we are better than others. And I feel that we should at least think humble because It would, because, blah, 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 blah. yeah. Well, I think it's because in America we have more opportunities, and I think that most of the people here believe that they have more potential to um, do better jobs. But, like, back in Mexico, there's not that many opportunities, there's not that much um, education. So that's why it's most, more people work in the fields because that's the only job that they can right. get. And that's true, but we still have the situation of the strawberries that are going bad and the people that don't have food. So how would you suggest working around to solve that problem so that the strawberries were harvested and that they did reach the maximum number of users, of consumers? Um, there are always another, um, a bit high number of um, unemployed people in every country, and um, I think they should um, use these people to, for example, to improve infrastructure or um, like in the news um, to harvest the strawberries because um, there's always, um, there are always things that must be done, but um, I think the problem is that the government um, doesn't agree with, uh, with several, um, with several things and um, I think they should more communicate with each other. So we have a situation of people's social beliefs and policy making actually affecting the food supply. Can you imagine that that might also take place in countries like Africa, and, and you know where there are where, where there is a lot more hunger than even here? That governments not cooperating, and I think you spoke a lot about that when you when you first started off. Questions? Um, I remember. Sure I Did you speak up? I 
not sure the exact percentage, but I saw something where it was like the there's a lot larger percent, the larger percent of the food that's get that's like exported or it's like the consumption rate. Like America has a higher percentage of consumption rate than countries that have a higher population than America. So I'm not sure what the exact percentage is. Like we take in more food, but we have less people. So we, and then like those countries, so they'll take that into consideration where other countries are getting more food than they actually need. Um, yeah, I agree because um, I think every day or my whole family or um, like everyone said from Germany that a lot of Americans just let, uh, just let a lot of food just on their plate and don't eat it. I mean, they took it, but uh, they won't eat it. Just, I don't know, they're not hungry anymore and they're full, but that's kind of just wasted. I mean, this food that lies on this plate could feed someone else. And I don't know, it's kind of weird. I mean, when we take something from Germany to eat, although we're full, we would eat it because it's just polite. I know it's the difference. I mean, um, but here you just let it on the plate, and it was weird for all of us, I think, from Germany, that it's just, just lays there and it's just wasted. The food. Um, yeah, I have a question if nobody else does. Um, what do you think that developed nations such as the United States and Germany can do to improve the situation so that there's less food being wasted, the, uh, the logistical transportation system for delivering food to the end user is doing a better job to reach others? What can we do as, as two developed nations that don't have to worry about food? What can we do to influence other leaders and basically just improve the situation overall? What's your future recommendation for the future outlook? <laughs> that, um, that in, to let to because in Africa they have like like lock, top, top trolleys or lollies or something like that, and which create creates like um, a blockage for people to get to one place to another. And I think that they should open that up because if they open it, it would allow more people to come in and trade and bring in more food. Mm -hmm. And it would also help the people to get food and be able to so just being more efficient and then getting rid of regulations that aren't needed to yeah. get the, the supply chain going quicker. And also wow. a lot of developing countries have got um, supply of raw materials or um, agricultural <coughs> products. And I think um, if they just start to care about themselves at first, the government um, use these products for their country at first and then um, the rest um, the other countries um, would be very helpful too. Does anybody have any further questions? Okay, would you guys like to add a, another comment or a conclusion? Um, I don't know, yesterday on Facebook I saw a picture um, that was about a story that um, in a coffee shop there were two people that bought uh, I think five coffees and they were playing just two but the other three they bought them just for people who could just came in the coffee shop and could drink it for free when they're poor and can't afford the money and I think that's like an awesome <laughs> yeah that's just awesome that some people would give money for other people that can't afford it their generosity and, and that has to come from the heart. And that is basically that is a system of a social net that those who have
take care of those who don't have. Well, thank you guys. and how um, it just, it takes away jobs for a lot of people. And it, my, my aunt, JC, she works for American Airlines and she used to make a lot of, a decent amount of money. You know, she, she, she worked hard and she was about to lose her job because they were going to outsource all of the jobs um, from American Airlines all the way to China. So she was going to be out of work, and she wasn't going to have the money to, um, to like, buy live. things, live, and, you know, buy things that could help the economy circulate. And I think that without those jobs, it kind of helps us crash and burn. And so, yeah. I'm going to present um, the main questions we were asked on our little uh, sheet, just to uh, give you guys a sense of... Uh, what we were talking about. So the first question was, uh, what caused the financial crash in uh, 2007? So basically, the problems were that the country spent more money than they had. And the other one was that um, the banks took or uh, invested in uh, projects and uh, had a pretty high risk. So um, the next question was, uh, what is terrorism? And Thatcherism is um, basically the ideas Margaret Thatcher came up with, and her main ideas are that, um, are that uh, are, yeah, like about a free market, so that prices should be set by sellers and buyers, and not uh, be controlled by the by the state by the government. And the last very very important question was um, what risks. Um, banks have to face, and one risk would be that um, loans will, or could not be paid back, so they lose, or they could lose their money on that. And the other risk would be that, um, yeah, that uh, that their clients, their customers, would withdraw their money because um, they are afraid, uh, they are afraid of losing it. But that makes it even worse and harder for the banks to. Um, yeah, to exist. Um, so the major concerns of the economic crisis, um, there's an international lack of money. Um, banks are spending money and people, they're not paying back their loans to the banks, so banks can't pay back their loans. So banks are losing money and countries are in debt because all of the banks are losing their money and the dollars are losing value, or the, do the face dollar the face value of the dollar is losing value. Yeah. The solution is to spend money on things that you can that can lose their value, for example, houses or gold. <coughs> um, the countries who, who borrow money need to fulfill certain conditions to avoid another financial crash. <coughs> you also need to stimulate economy and countries adapt. Another solution is a free market, but it is necessary to control the banks. Uh, the potential risk is uh, if countries borrow money all the time, debt worldwide is too high to pay off. And the economy can only grow so much to pay off the interest rates. So failure to, failure to pay debts can result in wars or action that can be international or civil to secure that money. And the cycle of money is broken and can cause a crisis affecting everybody. And if nothing changes about this, all countries will be poor and everyone would have to start earning money at the very beginning. Um, so now we're going to ask if any of you guys have questions. Yes, Travis? Okay. Um, one thing that we all know about, like, it's an economic, like, it's called Keynesian economics, I think. And I think what the policy is, is like what countries do 
because they have periods where they spend more and cut taxes, and then they go into the next period where they have to raise the taxes and cut the spending. And then that helps keep kind of the balance, balance of the debt. But well, like a lot of, I think one of the problems was a lot of people, the government does, is, an, is agreeing to do one of the things but not do the other. Like the Democrats want to raise the taxes and the Republicans want to cut the spending, but they don't want to do the other. So. See, I think that um, with that, they, I think that the political parties should um, like get their get both their ways. One, like one half of the year, they can cut spending and lower, or what did you say, cut spending and raise taxes, and then the next half of the year they can uh, raise spending and lower the taxes. So I think it could be the best of both worlds with that, um, so that each party gets their uh, what they want. Yes, Jax. So the United States of America is around $17 trillion in debt. And this is obviously not uh, going to be able to be paid off in anyone's lifetime. So to reach, and each child in the US is born with about $100,000 worth of, worth of debt to their name, which, uh, which leads me to the question, like, how would we reach uh, a conclusion with a different country to where we wouldn't have to be uh, enslaved by them instead of like I mean not enslaved you know what I mean just like to not be in debt with them for not be to completely be so far in debt to where subliminally they control our economy completely right um, well the thing is, to cut spending, there's so much spending in our country that is absolutely unnecessary. And I'm not even going to get to the sequester. But um, if we just cut the unnecessary spending, like, the go like for example, the government is giving scholarships to students to go to college, which, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But a school should give scholarships, right. not the a government. Right, it's, it's, it's the government doesn't have that money. But um, all examples aside, there just needs to be less spending and right. more responsible spending. Where would the school get the money? Um, not schools, but like scholarship programs or scholarship programs that raise money specifically for yes, giving scholarships. So more fundraising from yes, the private yes. sector? Yes. <coughs> yes, Travis? Yeah, I the sequester. Like the sequester, it only cut 8% in like the on the non this it's the spending that isn't that isn't social security and welfare which takes up those two take up sixty percent or and growing of what we spend and then out of the other forty percent half of it's military spending and the other half is everything else so cut, making cuts and the twenty percent that's everything else doesn't help the debt when it costs more when it's growing. Um, with, uh, with the military spending, what I think that we should do, if we're not in a, like, if we're not in a war that is costing us an extreme amount of money, like what they're giving the military, then we shouldn't have to pay that much for it. That's just my thinking. Because there's upkeep and there's like the paying for the, <coughs> just all the stuff that goes on during the training and everything that goes on while the military is not. Yes? I've got a question. Okay, so it's, it's pretty clear that we need more revenue coming into the government and we need less spending. So how are we to accomplish that if Congress is not willing to raise taxes to raise the revenue and they're not willing to cut? So if you, if you have a situation where you do have to find ways to cut expenses and you still need to raise revenues to cover the deficit, how can you do that if neither side if you're not willing is willing to, do, to cooperate? I think if you're not willing to do either, then I don't think it's possible. Right, so what, I think what that everyone can you send? I think that everyone should have an open mind. You know, like they can't be like, Oh, we cannot cut spending. You know, they, right. they need to not be extremists about it. Personally, um, I think that like corporate taxes should be lowered so that we can actually bring back some like domestic industry. 
Because yeah. a lot, because a lot of them are going to like other countries, and that's like that's money that could be spent here. Right. Exactly. Is that because of tax rates, or is it because of lower uh, labor costs? Well, well, because like here, the tax rates are way higher for corporate uh, companies, and plus, like they can pay like they can pay people like so much less in other countries. Mm -hmm. But I think that put, taking those co uh, companies to other countries allows it basically sets us up for failure because we're not having, you know, yes, we're spending less on those uh, deals, but like people aren't having those jobs, people in America don't get those jobs to get the money to stimulate our economy, to buy things. And that's what we need. Uh, Jax. Um, do you think that, that becoming a more independent nation as to uh, drilling oil and making our own products, our own, uh, our own products in country instead of uh, buying them elsewhere, do you think that that could help us become, uh, I don't know, more independent and help help our uh, our really poor spending choices? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, uh, this is the last one. One of the things I noticed y'all are talking about a lot of the ways to help America's economy, but it's also a world economic crisis. There's countries. I, there's a lot of countries that are a lot worse off than America, and actually, America, for right now, with our, and we're not good in the long term, but in the short term, we're still okay. And a lot of people are trying to fix the short term for America, but even if we brought all the jobs back to America and instead of outsourcing the out, outsourcing, it would only help our economy. It wouldn't help the economy in the of the entire world, it would actually probably hurt a lot of the countries that are benefiting from the new industries that are coming into their areas. That makes sense. I see your point completely. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, how do you, um, there's, there's always going to be a cycle of money, though. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. it's going to come from somewhere. Sabria, did you have a question earlier? Yes, I did. Sorry. Okay. Do you think in order to prevent a war and people becoming poor, do you think we should stop borrowing money from other countries? Oh, definitely. Because then we have to pay back money, money that we don't have because we spend the money that countries give us. And it just makes us out to have even more debt, you know? And we really don't want that. But I think, I think, like, a way to, like, save more money, you know, like, in previous wars, like, Americans, like, like the government has asked the citizens of America to like cut spending and save all that you can, conserve everything. And I think a lot of people feel like that's an, maybe the government think, thinks that that's an outrageous request or something. Right. I read, I, read, I read a figure that said that the money that was spent in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, every house in the United States could be equipped on their roof with solar panels. Mm. Can you imagine that? That would mean for you, you would not have to worry about energy anymore. That would cut down a lot of, yeah. you know, of the spending that Americans have to do, and that that let us save a lot. Yes, Ty. Okay, so this is a like about the outsourcing. How you're talking about our companies are having their products made in other countries because it's cheap to do that. If say there was some plan put in place to force companies to make their product here, don't you think that the prices of the products that we buy every day, they're just going to increase more? Like you think shoes, like these shoes that I'm wearing right now cost like maybe $50 about, and they were made in probably some third world country. If they were made here and they had to pay more to have people make them, don't you think that these shoes would become like even a more ridiculous price, like maybe even $100, because the price that they pay those third world country people, pennies in the dollar, based on what they would have to pay, pay people here, like minimum wage, the prices on the products that we buy every day, like shoes, all that stuff would just triple and would not, I feel, would more damage the economy rather than hurt it, because no one's going to have enough money to buy everything. But just like when, back whenever, during the French Revolution, people couldn't buy the food that was offered to them. That's why people were starving, because the food was so expensive, 
but the jobs that they had weren't paying enough. And so if you can't buy those products that you need, then there's no revenue going back into the American economy. Yes, but see, like, the shoes that I'm wearing probably cost about 50 bucks too. But how much does it, how much do companies spend on supplies to make these shoes? What, like, three, three dollars? Maybe a little bit more or less? Why, why do they, why do they make us spend so much on shoes that hardly, you know, cost anything to make? I think if they brought them back and they uh, to America and they sold it for the same price, they'd still be making a huge profit. It's not. It's, the reason they cost so much is not because of the materials that it makes that it costs to make it. It's the manual labor that is needed to make it. Yes, but they hardly. They I'd like hardly to uh, add something here, and then we're going to have to go ahead and wrap it up because it's time to head back. But um, keep in mind that most of these companies that outsource are international uh, corporations who are publicly traded, whose stock is owned by people all across the globe. So you're talking about all of us. You're talking about every nation, every investor, whether it's in Germany or in France or Russia or in the United States, able to buy and own stock in those publicly traded corporations. So it's a global economy. It's all interlinked, and what happens here affects Portugal and what happens in Portugal affects us and the money has swapped hands so many times and been lent to each other. So we're all in it together and um, I think that this was an outstanding discussion and it could go on for a long time. So thank you guys so much. It was very good.